way back in 1836, when America was still an open country full of bears and cougars and marauding Indians, when land was there for the taking, if you could defend it long enough to grow crops on it and raise animals and have a family to help you with the chores, a battle took place down in the deep southwest in a territory that people used to call the Texas. On one side, there were thousands of Mexican regular soldiers marching with rifles and cannons under the command of the famous mustachioed general, Santa Ana. On the other, there were less than 200 Americans, looked after by Jim Bowie, the Arkansas scout. The Americans were all volunteers from every part of the frontier land. Woodsmen, scouts, hunters, trappers, riverboat sailors, even a dance hall gambler and a boy who made his living getting honey from bees. They were there for just one thing, to hold the Mexicans back long enough so the new American army under Sam Houston could get up enough steam to drive them back into the Rio Grande. Well, they held out for 12 days at an old mission called the Alamo. But the odds were better than 10 to 1, and every last American paid with his life. One of the last to die was the most adventurous Indian scout, bear hunter, congressman, and pioneer hero the country had ever seen. His name was Colonel Davy Crockett, and this is his story. Chucker partridges settle in. Whereabouts, Davy? On the sunset table of birds, looks like. Mm, take my gun down then and have a try. But you know the setup. Only enough powder and ball for one shot. Yeah. They cost money and ain't easy to get. You miss and you don't get supper. Bring back a partridge and your mama cook them up pretty. Hey, you know what I'll do? I just wait for them partridge to get in the line and then I'll knock them all down with one shot and make a war bonnet out of the feathers. <laughs> Just one bird will do, Davy. And take him in the head. Don't want none of that sweet meat spoiled. Young Davy wasn't even nine years old when he saw those birds settle in on the hillside. But he'd already had years in the woods behind him. His father and grandfather, who'd come over from Ireland, had both fought the British in the Revolutionary War before moving down into the state of Franklin. Later on, in 1796, this territory was to be called Tennessee, and it was there that Davy learned what he needed to know about hunting and trapping in order to eat and stay warm. He walked into the woods with his dad's big gun on his shoulder, a gun a foot taller than he was, and kept his eye on the place where partridges had flown down. Boy, one of these days I'll be allowed to take out as much ammunition and powder as I can tote. And then I'll bring home a, a whole pack of game. Turkeys and rabbits and quail and deer and maybe even a bear. Bear's that thing. Boy, ain't a man till you got yourself a big old bear. Enough meat for half the winter. And the hide makes a good rug for sitting. No use thinking about that, though, with just one shot to my name. Better off worrying about how to smile a raccoon out of a tree to make me a cap. Hold on. What's that moving around in that blueberry patch? Wow, it's a bear cub. And a fat one, too. Hey, come back here. No sooner had Davy jerked back anxiously on the trigger than the cub's huge mother came scrambling up to see what the trouble was. Now, Davy had missed the cub by a good foot. He was in so much of a hurry. But that didn't soothe the big bear any. She roared again. And took off after him. She would have caught him, too, if he hadn't turned and run down the hill, since that's the only way a person can beat a running bear. When Davy returned to the cabin, all he got for his trouble was a scolding for being so foolish as to shoot at a cub. And because he'd missed, he went to bed without supper. <laughs> I was just a breed of cub myself then, Quaker John, with a whole parcel to learn. But I sure enough killed me an even dozen bears by the time I was 12. 
Well, you're going to need every bit of good aim you've got, Davy, if you're going to win this shooting match here today. Well, bullseyes ain't bars, Quaker John. But they ain't moving none either. Why, they're easier to hit than a 30-pound standing chicken. <laughs> <laughs> this was the biggest shooting match ever held in the state of Tennessee. But Davy wasn't in it just for the fun and dancing. He was out to win the prime beef live steer that came as first prize. Because if he won the steer, he'd have enough property to get married. And Polly Finley, a neighbor's daughter, was the girl of his heart. All right, all right, you Cracker Jacks, hear me out. We start at 50 yards from the target. Each man just gets one shot. Then it gets bullseyes, shoots at 75 yards. Then the three top marksmen shoot at 100. Get me? Load up! The first time around, there were nearly 50 men tied for the first three places. Davy gave a long whistle, realizing how good all these other pioneers were. But the Durham steer was worth the concentration, so he loaded his flintlock and took careful aim at 75 yards. Just fire when you're ready, uh, gentlemen. This time, there were only three men left. An old veteran scout named Clark, a hunter called Johnson, and Davy. At a hundred yards, they took their turns, and the crowd fell silent. Clark! Bullseye! Johnson! Bullseye! Crockett! another 10 yards, and then we tries again. Mr. Clark? Oh, oh, on the small circle, Mr. Clark, but off the bullseye. Oh. Mr. Johnson? Oh, nick the bullseye, but not dead on. Mr. Crockett. Davy looked over at the big steer chewing on the grass. Then, up at the target. Why, if that old bullseye was a bear running upside down on a tree branch floating up a river, I could knock a fly off his nose. I could do it riding backwards on a Tennessee mule. Just hold tight, Polly Finley. You're about to get a husband. So Davy won his steer, sold it for a $5 gold piece, which was a considerable amount of money back then, and married his Polly. Mrs. Finley gave her daughter the family spinning wheel. Quaker John staked them to supplies at his store, and before long, they had a child of their own. But Davy had the frontier blood running in his veins, and he wasn't made to sit still. Now, Polly, this here land we keep hearing talk about in South Tennessee, it's just there for the taking. But we got a baby boy to think of, and the horses, and how'd we live in wild country like that? Well, I'll build us a big old timber raft and set you and the baby and the horses and the spinning wheel right up on top. And I'll tie a rope to it with the other end around my waist, sit down on the back of some fat alligator, and get us towed the whole way down. <laughs> You're impossible, Davy. But if you've got a mind for something, I guess we better do it, or there won't be no peace. So they got passage on a 60-foot flatboat, full up with families of children, 
crates of squawking chickens, trappers with bundles of coonskins, scouts in buckskin shirts like Davies, and they all move down the Holston River. When they got to the country that's now called Lincoln County, Tennessee, the Crockett's went ashore. And started west. Now, Polly, you and the baby ride up on the old horse with the colts behind. I'll walk on ahead with the dog. Oh, Davy, it's beautiful. Just smell the sweetness in the wind. There's more bars and bees and turkeys and coons and partridge than anywhere else. And they're all just waiting for us to come along. Once I had a collie pump, down the hole and covered him up. I got through for most of all, waiting for a collie pump. Round and round, old Joe Clark. Round and round, I Round and round, old Joe Clark. Good time, So the Crockett's made a new home, right in the middle of where no one had ever set foot before. In a clearing by the Mulberry Fork of Elk River, Davy built a small cabin with his own hands. They planted greens and corn and gourds and potatoes. Davy hunted whenever he got free of working the land, and they were full up with bear meat, possum, venison, wild honey, and every kind of berry and fruit the fields had to offer. But it was also the land of the Creek Indians, who didn't take very well to having their country walked over by strangers in coonskin caps. Every so often, news of a small raid reached the Crockett cabin and gave Davy something to think about. Then one day, a group of men rode up while Davy was out chopping a tree. And he knew there was trouble when he saw their worried faces. Hey there! You the Davy Crockett we heard tell about? Depends on what you heard. The Creeks just massacred a whole settlement of women and children, Mr. Crockett, down in Fort Mims. We heard you killed a hundred bears since you got to Tennessee, and we thought you might want to have a try at the engines. Fort Mims? Why, that's a peaceable settlement. Hey, it was. Ain't even a peaceable Polly had come out now. into the yard to see what all the commotion was, and she stood there while the men talked. She knew that if Davy was needed, he'd have to go. So when he looked in her direction, she smiled bravely and nodded her head. Well, looks like you got another man, gentlemen. I ain't never been to one of these war things, but I hear talk about him. One thing, though, it was 105 bars, all of them as big as the horses you're setting on. Well, don't just stare like a bunch of horned owls. Come in and have some food while I get myself ready. So Davy went off under the command of Major William Russell. He worked for the Army as a scout, not as a regular soldier, always moving ahead of the small band of volunteers, watching the forest floor for signs of Indians, keeping an ear to the wind for sounds that would give the creeks away. One day... In the territory that would later become the state of Alabama, while moving towards the camp of General Andrew Jackson, Davy was half a mile in front of his men when he heard a familiar sound. Now that's funny. Wouldn't be no chicken that I know of wandering around the woods. But it sure must be something. Easy now. This might be a rooster wearing war paint. Davy dropped to the ground just as the arrow cleaved the air next to his head. But he yelled anyway to make the Indian think he'd been hit. Then he lay as still as the tree behind him and waited. But at first, nothing happened. Quite suddenly, from an opening across the clearing, there appeared a face streaked with red and yellow markings. Okay, Mr. Russo, let's see what kind of feathers you've got. Looks like a creek, all right. And if there's one of them, there's bound to be more. At 
General Jackson's camp, Davy and Major Russell told what had happened to Colonel Coffey, a white-haired fighting veteran of the Revolution. Well, Crockett, Major, that creek you killed probably belonged to the tribe camp somewhere on the Coosa River. If that's so, Colonel, we'd better get after them. They're not about to sit still very long before they try to join up with the bands here to Tallapoosa. And if that happens, there'll be more of them than we can handle. Has the general arrived with the new volunteers yet? He's on his way, but he won't be happy when he gets here. Not enough food to feed even the men you brought. Pardon me, Colonel, sir, but what's the food difficulty? No meat. We got flour, salt, and molasses, but no meat. That's so. What you need's a couple of hundred steaks, I reckon. Now, don't be funny, Crockett. We got trouble enough. Hardly being funny, Major. You just give me ten good shooting men for today and tomorrow, and trust my trigger finger. Davy got his ten men and marched them off mysteriously into the woods. <laughs> The following day, General Andrew Jackson arrived at the camp with his army of Tennesseans, men more than willing to get after the Indians who had massacred the settlers at Fort Mims. All they wanted first was a good meal in their stomachs. These volunteers are hungry men, Colonel. It's taken us too long to get the powder and guns to start rolling. We were all right for that kind of thing, General, but we are possum poor on food. Well, I suggest you find a way to get rich quick, or... <laughs> the General never got a chance to finish. Coming into the far end of camp was a small parade of men, led by fifers and drummers. When they got closer, the officers could see it was Davy and his shooting men, all of them in coonskin caps and buckskin shirts. And hanging from a pole between every two men was a huge black bear. Who's that man, Colonel? One waving his cap. That's Davy Crockett, sir. First man to draw creek blood. Well, I do believe I heard of him. Scout Crockett, put that creature down a moment. Yes, sir. Happy to. At your service, General. You're the same Crockett I heard about further north. Tell me, is it true you killed your first bear when you were five? General, sir, someone's been bending your ear. Well, I was a grown-up man, about ten years old when I'd done that. So the small army had their bear steaks and slept well that night. But time was as much of an enemy as the creeks, and they were up before dawn, moving down towards the Coosa River. Davy had seen signs of heavy movement while he'd been out hunting, and he rode ahead with Colonel Coffey, trying to catch up with the Indians that had once raided the fort. They had no luck until a friendly Indian came to their camp and told them the Creeks had their headquarters not more than a day's ride away. It sounds like the real thing, Crockett. You ride on up ahead, and when you've got hold of something, let us know right quick. Davy did more than just ride ahead. He dismounted when he was near the Indian camp and crept in on foot until he could almost reach out and touch the dogs that guarded the camp. He reported back and they waited until dark. Then the colonel ordered them all to lead their horses in single file until they were near enough to attack. Finally, Davy signaled that they should go no further, and the soldiers mounted in silence. Just ahead of them, between clumps of pine trees, they could see the rows of unsuspecting Indian huts. All the campfires were out, and the dogs were quiet. The entire camp was asleep. A pale moon shone in the sky above them, and all the birds and forest animals were silent. Colonel Coffey looked at the faces of the soldiers around him and raised his pistol for the signal. <laughs> The 
Creeks never even had a chance to get to their horses. They used their bows and what rifles and muskets they had while standing on the ground. Davy galloped forward, fired, and saw one fall. Then he turned his weapon around, held it by the barrel, and used it as a club, swinging left and right and knocking down one creek after another. Here and there, a soldier toppled from his horse as an enemy bullet or arrow found its mark. But the Indians suffered far worse, and they dropped everywhere. In less than 15 minutes, it was over. The Creeks that hadn't been killed were rounded up and taken prisoner. It was a complete victory for the volunteers, and the massacre at Fort Mims had been avenged. Much later, when the campaign was over, Davy had a chance to talk about it to his neighbors and wife at home. And that was just the first of it. We whooped them again at the Talladega, where I got this tomahawk scar. Mm -hmm. And then on the Tallapoosa. That was a closer one, that was, because they caught us in the middle of the river. But old Hickory Jackson, he used his cannon from the far shore, and we whooped them again. Oh, Davy, ought to thank your stars. You're all of peace. Why, Polly, it'd be that much better if they knocked me in half. Then there'd be two of me, and I'd take care of twice as many creeks. <laughs> <laughs> But Davy hadn't had enough of taking chances. He moved his family again, this time to the wild region of the Obion River in western Tennessee. It was a land full of still larger bears, beaver, otter, wild geese, and giant turtles. He set up a small mill, taught his boys all he knew about hunting, and even tried his hand at moving timber down the big Mississippi. By this time, the army had promoted him to colonel and he even decided to run for Congress in Washington. Well, folks, y'all heard my two opponents give their speeches, but I ain't gonna make any fuss. I got my promises all sewed up in a fat alligator hide at home if anybody wants to drop around and take a look. Why, if I had it my way, I'd get the whole national capital shifted right down on the banks of the Oberon in West Tennessee. <laughs> I saw my old friend, Mirabelle Chicken, walking around the hen coop. And I up and said to her, Miss Mirabelle, who are you voting for in this old election? And she said, Crockett, Crockett. So Davy Crockett went to Congress. And when he served out one term, they elected him for another. It was quite a thing to see. Davy standing up to talk in the Capitol building, wearing his buckskin shirt and holding his coonskin cap under his arm. He wasn't a man to hold a grudge either. When the Indians had been soundly defeated and it came time to divide up the public land, he fought hard to give them a share of what had belonged to them in the first place. Gentlemen, it's one thing for you all to sit around here in this nice white building and talk about Indians like they were possums. But they ain't. They're men like you and me. The Creeks and Cherokees and other eastern tribes are used to living in villages. Move them out to the west like you want to, and they'd be killed off by roving tribes. Tribes like the Pawnees and the Sioux. Boy, I'd rather be an old coon dog belonging to a poor man in the woods. That was Davy in Washington. That belonged to a party that won't do justice. But when his second term was over, he just went back to the Obion and became a bear hunter again. Then... In 1835, he heard a lot of talk about the new territory people called the Texas. It was supposed to be a big open country, farther across than a man could ride in a month of steady travel. At that time, it was ruled by Mexico, but General Sam Houston, who had fought the Creeks and also served as governor of Tennessee, declared he was about to fight for the independence of the Americans settled there. His appeal, along with that of Sam Austin, reached Davy's ears and it wasn't long before he was traveling towards the small town of San Antonio. Along the way, being as famous as he was, he picked up a good many friends. You, sir. I say, aren't you Mr. Colonel Crockett? The very one. And from the look of your frills and coattails, mister, I'd say you were a gambler. That I am, Colonel. But rather a good shot as well. 
I dare say I could knock the crown off the King of Diamonds at 50 paces. And you there, son. What's your living? I'm just a bee hunter, Colonel. I get the honey from their nests, but I can hunt Mexicans too. Well, gentlemen, if you can fight as good as you talk, it won't be long for the Texas is free as the wind. Along the way, they shot buffalo for food and picked up two more men, a pirate who had once sailed with Jean Lafitte and an old, old Indian who knew the different ways of the wide open land before them. Together, they rode to San Antonio and finally came to the gates of an old mission used as a fort, a place called the Alamo. Waiting for them was Colonel Jim Bowie from Arkansas, the famous scout who had developed the two-sided knife blade. We've been on the lookout for you all week, Davy. Hey, you Texas, turn up for David Crockett. Now, before you go celebrating, Colonel, you better tell me what your troubles are. I hear you got a heap. You heard right, Davy. Santana, the Mexican general, is marching to invade the Texas with several thousand men. Several thousand, you say? How extraordinary. You don't look like you got too many here, that's for sure. 120 before you arrived. Well, you got 125 now. <laughs> General Houston is getting an army ready north of here, but this is our first defense against the Mexicans. If we can give them a week more to get ready... Why, sir, we'll give them two weeks. And the only way to do it is to get real wild and hold this fort. You've got it figured. Gentlemen, I'm wild already. Let's hold this here Alamo. <laughs> For the next four days, the volunteers inside the Alamo got ready. They cleaned and re-cleaned their rifles, readied the cannon, got in more supplies, and cheered each other with stories and songs. Thirty-one more soldiers arrived to fight, and that brought their number to 156. On the morning of February 22nd, 1836, the guards along the top of the Alamo's walls saw the first of the enemy army approaching. Well, Davy, looks like there's a pack of them all right. A whole lot more than we can whip. Right, Chuck. We can hold them for a while, and that's what we're here for. Let's hear those cannon. Americans fired their first salvo, and then another, being careful to find a good target since their supply of cannonballs was low. The young beekeeper sang songs. The old Indian took his turn shooting from the top of the walls. The pirate served on the cannon, and the gambler took more chances than he ever had in a card game. But as the days of fighting wore on, the enemy used more and more men. They charged the fort repeatedly and opened fire at close range, while the men inside picked them off and ran out of ammunition. Finally, on the twelfth day, there was scarcely a bullet left inside the fort, and the final Mexican charge was successful. They threw up ladders against the walls and climbed over. Davy and his men fought with knives and fists and gun butts, but the numbers were far too great, and somewhere in the fire and smoke, Davy Crockett died. But the 12 days had given General Houston enough time to get his Texans ready. And it wasn't very long before he swept down from the north and destroyed the entire Mexican army. Their battle cry was, Remember the Alamo. And many a man among them remembered the incredible hero in a coonskin cap who had given his life so Texas would be free. Their hunter, Indian scout, congressman, and pioneer Davy Crockett's great legend was just beginning. Round and round I say, round and round, oh Joe Clark, goodbye Billy Brown. Round and round, oh Joe Clark, round and round I say, round and round, oh Joe Clark, goodbye Billy Brown.